El Nino is rolling forward as we move out of the spring unpredictability barrier. I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Saturday, June 3rd. Storm Surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people. All the time, no hype. Be sure and like and subscribe. Ring the bell. You get automatic notifications when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday evenings. And if you want to, donate a little money using the special thanks button below, the heart with the dollar sign in it. And with that, I'd like to thank the folks that donated last week. Tim Caston, Sporman, Jason, Lloyd Morrison, and Baja Bugs, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. And then Gerard Franco, a very large donation. Got to appreciate that. I mean, really, you went above and beyond the call of duty. Thank you so much. And with that, let's move forward to this week's forecast. We'll start by looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean. And right now, things are pretty quiet. Australia there, New Zealand there, Ross Ice Shelf. Ice slowly creeping to the north, though, as indicated in a post on Instagram that I did, um, the ice is not proceeding as quickly to the north as in years past. In fact, it's the slowest uh, ever uh, in the satellite era, and last year was the slowest before that. So um, things are moving kind of slow. Good for surf production, though. It creates more area here to allow storms and fetch to get traction on the ocean surface. So not all bad news there. All right, let's move on. We'll do a quick roundup of conditions along the California and Hawaii coast, starting in Northern California. Point Reyes buoy number 029. We're looking at all the energy that's hitting that buoy all from way up at 33.3 second period, super long period energy, which there is none, all the way down to five second period, basically wind chop. Any sort of wind swell, I generally consider starting at about six seconds. And then semi swell starts at around 10 seconds and quote unquote ground swell starts at about 13 seconds. That's what uh, I typically am most interested in. We see a bit of energy here, sort of background southern hemi energy, but in each frequency band, we're talking max about a half a foot. The big bump here, wind swell in this area, putting all the area under this lump here together, that would constitute the wind swell, and that comes to about 6.6 .6 feet at 7.8 seconds from 310 degrees. And then some background energy, roughly 1.3 feet at 14.8 seconds from 214 degrees. Oh, surf, that's two foot thigh high, and the wind swell head high theoretically at the buoy, probably less than that near shore. Trying to tease out the Southern Hemi energy while well, we go down to uh, Point Santa Cruz buoy, number 254. This is pretty much blocked from all the northwest wind swell. You see just this sort of a steady little underlying four-tenths of a foot at a variety of seconds. Uh, Pierce primary swell 0.7 feet at 16.8 seconds from 199 degrees. That's surf of about 1.2 feet. We'll give it a uh, knee high or something like that and then some other secondary energy in there. Another good way to play the how do I separate the northwest wind swell from the southern hemi swell is you go down to Point Loma South or some other buoys in more in the exposed area of the southern California. And, you know, the, the northwest wind swell really doesn't get in there. You can see that here anywhere from 0 0.7, 0 0.8 of a foot at 15 to 16 seconds. Yeah, there is some wind swell mixed in there. But what do we have? Primary swell, 1.3 feet at 15.9 seconds from 192 degrees. That's 2.1 feet. So, again, knee, thigh high, something like that. Top spots, probably certainly waist or maybe chest high. Then same deal on the south shore of the Hawaiian Islands. We're actually using the Lanai buoy because it's a little bit more protected from any northwest or west or east wind swell. Um, we see, well, what do we see? A variety, of, just sort of this steady background southern hemi base state swell. Nothing super defined. I mean, that said, 
There is a small southern hemi swell that's trying to hit California now. Probably not hitting Hawaii, but there is uh, background energy from the Tasman Sea that's been seeping up to the north and, and hitting Hawaii. Primary swell, one foot at 15.9 seconds from 169 degrees. That's That degree there is a little bit suspect. We all see 1.3 feet at 12.7 seconds from 185 degrees. Either way, surf one and a half feet. We'll give it, you know, knee to thigh high, something like that. All right, so what's going on? We're, this is Hindcast data going back a week till uh, Saturday night, uh, May 28th. A tiny little gale here developed with 30-foot seas aimed pretty well off to the north. Oh, and let's get organized here. So San Diego is like at about 117, 118 west, so right there. So unless fetch is aimed like in that direction, it's not going to get into San Diego. This due, pretty much due south, and maybe a little bit of this into Northern California. Uh, this system, you can see it built some as we got into Sunday morning a week ago. Uh, seas 33 feet at 34.75 north, right there where the plus sign is. See the plus there? So you look there. This is the highest seas anywhere in the domain of this graphic. And 115 west, so a little bit, this was a little bit east of the Southern California swell window. But you get the idea. Some swell radiating north. That swell uh, is the sixth in a series of gales that have developed here in the far southeast Pacific. Uh, typical La Nina kind of pattern. You go, wait a minute, aren't we in El Nino? Not yet. Hangover from La Nina, still in control, driving the storm track. I mean, this is where the main region for development during El, uh, La Nina sort of situations. During El Nino years, it's over here. So still suffering from La Nina, but you see this system moved out. Now I'm going to roll back again. Another little gale started developing on Sunday as well in the Southeast Pacific. Seas 26 or 27 feet, oh, briefly to 28 feet right there on Monday a week ago, then faded out, then pulsed again on uh, Tuesday morning. Let's go back right there. Uh, 27 foot seas continuing in about the 27 foot range in the Southern California swell window and Northern California lifting north and then fading, well, building actually. Good news for Peru, Chile, Central America, but out of the Southern California swell window targeting Mexico and points on south of there before it too faded out. And so there is one swell starting to hit, very minimal. You saw how tiny the fetch area was on that first system, but it was positioned pretty well to the north. This next system, bigger in aerial coverage, sees not quite as high, but some swell to result from that as well. Then we got into later this week, and we'll just roll this through to right about now where we are, and we have a calm pattern. So let's look forward. We're going to start looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales when they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a push in the jet to the north. Right, so here's the northern branch of the jet. The southern branch, well, piece a piece of it there. Another piece of it is like crashing into the Ross Ice Shelf. I think it's that the Ross the ice line. It doesn't show on this graphic, but it's right about 65, 64 south, something like that. So you see the jet diving here. That does no good. You want a trough where the jet pushes to the north. And right there, what that helps do is create a clockwise flow aloft and down at the ocean surface. That clockwise flow is the sign of low pressure. And of course, low pressure, if it's strong enough, generates winds. Winds eventually get traction on the ocean surface and create seas, a raw sea state. As those seas move away from the fetch area, they eventually turn into swell, they get groomed out. When that swell hits your beach, you get surf. All right, so we do have a trough, but it's pretty much moving out by now of uh, even the Southern California swell window targeting Peru, uh, Chile, uh, Central America, up into maybe Mexico. Then looking forward, we're into Sunday. The jet kind of starts, well, the ice line's right down here. It's moving pretty much over the ice, ice line. No clear troughs indicated. And you see it just, you know, right on the hairy edge of the ice line. Then we get into Wednesday night, the 7th of June. A bit of a trough starts developing south of New Zealand, pushing off across the south central Pacific with a little bit more energy on Friday. Um, 
may be offering some help, but the wind speed's not particularly high. I mean, you really want like a in the purple here, 140 knot winds to really, whoops, to really get some good traction on the ocean. You know, to get the upper atmosphere moving to feed gale development. We're not seeing that. So let's go take a look down at the ocean surface and see what the wind situation is forecast there. Here we are, surface level pressure, surface level winds, high pressure in the split jet stream. Typically when you get a split jet, you get high pressure in between. The trough was located here in the southeast Pacific. There's our low pressure system with a tiny little fetch at 35 knot winds aimed north and not in, in really our main forecast window. Next, gale starts building, but east of the Southern California swell window. This is for uh, Chile, Peru, Central America, and uh, Mexico. Look at that nice area of even 55 knot winds as we get into Sunday night and Monday. If you're down here, you're going to score. If you're not there, you're not, <laughs> pretty much. Um, high pressure continues, and we know the next little sort of zonal flow with the jet pushing right over the edge of the ice shelf. It's like right there. So we'll just sort of look at this. Yeah, we see winds, 40 knot winds, all aimed due east. You really want fetch aimed off to the northeast to produce swell for California and Hawaii. We're not seeing that. You do get sideband energy that comes, put radiates north, but generally size is pretty minimal. The number of set waves in a period, pretty minimal. So not any clear signs. This gale starts building all the fetch aimed at Antarctica, a penguin storm for sure, and falling southeast, not good there. We're into Friday. We're, all, we're almost a week out, and we're not seeing anything that all falling south too. This is not really unexpected given that we're still in a La Nina type pattern. Now here, there's this little gale forecast a week out, but it too is falling southeast. The models, you know, I do, I do the long written forecast, the Pacific forecast, do it about every other day, something like that. And, you know, the models have been teasing of these systems five, seven days out. None of them materialize. So all this is voodoo here. Don't believe any of it. And even what the models are showing, crashing to the southeast, this is not unexpected. Atmospherically, I think the South Pacific still believes we're in La Nina. We'll get into all the details in a minute, but that seems like where we're at. I've been, people have been asking, well, when's El Nino going to do something in the South Pacific? And I've been saying, well, maybe late July. So, you know, that's a guess. Don't hold me to it. But that sort of seems, at least right now, that's what the pattern is suggesting. La Nina still in control of the South Pacific. So those winds blow over the South Pacific, they get traction on the ocean surface and create seas. So we're looking at significant wave heights. The, uh, the highest one third of waves generated by any fetch. We're looking for really at least 26 foot seas. So that'd be that, that blob of red there, that shade of red. We don't see anything. Oh, in New Zealand, Australia, Chile, Peru. Swell windows starting for California right about here. For Hawaii, and the storm, for the most part, either goes up through the Tasman Sea, but then gets filtered out by these islands, or it pops around the uh, southeast edge of New Zealand, prime for Hawaii, once it gets past about 156, 157 here, then it's out of the Hawaii swell window. Now, we do see a gale developing pretty strong, uh, 37-foot seas right here. Uh, this would be on Sunday evening. Uh, but again, this is all a Chile, Peru, Central America type storm. A new gale tries to build a 24-foot seas, 25-foot seas. There you go, 28 foot seas as we get into Tuesday, but all the storms moving this way, all the fetch is aimed that way. So great for Chile, Peru, not so much for Hawaii or the U.S. West Coast, and seas not even that big at that. Tries again, theoretically, Wednesday night into Thursday, two little batches. Both of those dissolve into nothingness, and we kind of know where this is going just by looking at the surface level pressure charts and then we descend into nothingness from there. 
Local wind forecast. All right, so uh, this is the GFS model, surface level pressure and surface level winds, the wind barbs. Don't know if you know how to read these, but just quick tutorial. So let's look at that little tiny barb there. That's the direction the wind is blowing, the staff. The flag at the end of it tells you wind speed. One barb is 10 knots. If you have a half barb, like, like right there, or maybe right there, that's five knots. You have two wind barbs, that'd be 20 knots. Three wind barbs, 30 knots. You get the, the drill here. All right, so last week we were a bit concerned about uh, strong northwest winds were uh, forecast to blow along the North California coast, and the concern was not about producing wind swell, but about water temperatures plumbing, uh, ag plummeting. Again, went and looked at all the latest water temperatures, pretty much from San Francisco southward. We're still in the 54 plus degree range, which is okay. North of there, Things pretty chilly, 50 degrees, 51 degrees. So the wind swell or the effect, the upwelling effect is pretty much confined to wherever the winds are. So as we get into Sunday, here we go, another pressure gradient, high pressure building over the Gulf of Alaska, heat low pressure inland that, that tightens these, these blue lines, the isobars that creates wind. You see 30 to 35 knot northwest winds for Cape Mendocino. That'll produce wind swell down here but relative to let's say point reyes southwards wind looked pretty light at least in the morning hawaii very light trades 10 knots something like that so we get into sunday night 35 didn't i see a little bit of 40 knot winds off of cape mendocino but a relatively light flow my guess is you actually get an eddy flow south winds when when this sort of situation sets up so south winds along central california up into north california that's good for keeping water temperatures or if anything building water temperatures in that area same sort of drill as we get into monday trades remain light for the hawaiian islands tuesday the gradient fades out you can literally see the south winds now along the central california California coast per the model. This is Tuesday, June 6. Trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Wednesday, more of the same. South winds, lighter though, for California. Light trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Thursday, no real change. Friday, a light northwest flow. Uh, no wind swell production. That, that gradient, certainly, in fact, let's go back and look. The wind swell to hold into, oh, somewhere right around there. So maybe into Tuesday morning, the wind swell starts fading for north and central California. Thursday, just a light northwest flow. Trades remain light for the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, Friday, light northwest wind swell, uh, wind flow for California. No wind swell and a trades maybe picking up to 15 knots for the hawaiian islands we get into saturday northwest winds build a little bit 10 to 15 knots for california trades build some for the hawaiian islands at 15 knots and that gets us to the end of our forecast a week out Quick look at the snow and temperature forecast. Really, we're, we're looking for signs of any uh, big melt of snow up high. The snow level, as best I can tell, just by looking at cameras and associated stuff, solid, pretty much solid snow coverage at 8,000 feet and above. Given that we're in June, that's pretty impressive. Totally skiable. 8,000 feet and up, and theoretically, so this is for uh, the Pacific Crest Trail where it intersects with Tioga Pass Road there in the in uh, going over Yosemite, maybe like a third of an inch of snow. Doubtful that's even going to happen, maybe some rain. But looking at the freeze level, so the red it would be, you know, above freezing temperatures, the, the uh, gray is... 32 to 37 degrees, so sleet potentially, and then the hard freeze line is right at where the white starts, so at about 12,500 feet. Doing that into about June 6th, then the, the freeze line, uh, it actually gets colder, falls to maybe about the 11,000 foot range, something like that, into about Saturday, June 10th, and then back up to 12,500 feet. And then you see the real start of summer here coming about June 12th. When you start seeing this red pushing up to 14,000 feet, then it's all over. So, so far, actually, this sort of moderate coolish pattern at elevation is kind of a good thing it prevents this you know there's loads of snow i don't know what it, the exact numbers are right now i think it's 
300% of normal snow for this time of year. So a lot of snow relative to the time of year. And if you got a sudden hot flash for multiple days in the high Sierra, it'd be a river of melting snow running down over the falls and down in the rivers. We're not seeing that. This is good. It's, it prevents flooding and just sort of we're, we're, we stay in the mode of a steady, slow melt, but nothing out of control. All right, so surf forecasts for a couple of spots. We'll start in Northern California, Half Moon Bay, California. We see, what, six-foot surf? That looks like it's all wind swell. It starts dying off. And then some other little swell bumps up here. My guess is, so underneath this, there is this, uh, what is it, uh, swell number six, this tiny background, that little gale that was right on the hairy edge of the, the California swell window. It's going to be buried by this northwest wind swell. But then there is another swell behind that, so Southern Hemi Swell. That likely arrives, it looks like about Wednesday afternoon, slowly fading through next weekend. Let's go into the particulars. Yeah, here we go. Uh, wind swell five to six feet at eight to nine to ten seconds. And then you get into Wednesday, and then it is two and a half feet at initially 17 seconds, slowly working its way down to 13 seconds. So some swell, and here's the model direction. It says 199 degrees, but the reality is it's probably more like 185, something like that. The raw models have a t hard time teasing this out. I, I manually go and build, you know, track the great, find the great circle directions for a lot of these swells, track where, or these storms, track where the center is, and then come up with the swell direction. That's what's posted in the forecasts on the site. The automated tools are good, but they're not nearly as precise, and I like it to be precise. So then we head down to uh, Dana Point, uh, good representation for Southern California. We see surf size in the two and a half to three foot range. That's that first small Southern Hemi swell, and then things build into about the four foot range as we get into late Tuesday night and Wednesday fading from there into the late later part of next week. Swell sizes two feet initially from at 13, 14 seconds kind of thing from 187 degrees. Then the next swell arrives, swell size building to about 2.7 to 2.9 feet at you know, 16 seconds dribbling down from there. And then for the south shore of Oahu, we're using Maui just because it's probably more accurate. Uh, surf sizes, one and a half feet, somewhere like that, sort of jumping around, but nothing too solid. We go down and look. Swell size, one foot, one and a half feet at you now 17, 16 seconds, and then some wind swell and little bits of dribbles of stuff. So pretty much a continuation of what is going on now on the South Shore. That said, there is theoretically some activity forecast for the Northern Hemi. All right, California here, Hawaii down here, Japan there. Uh, the remnants of what was Super Typhoon Marwar uh, is tracking up the Japan coast. We're just looking at significant wave heights here. Theoretically, as we get into Sunday evening, seas at 24 feet approaching the dateline. The dateline right there. Lucian Islands right there. Pushing over the dateline with 20 to 22 foot seas and then dissipating from there. Hawaii is down here. The front from that swell right there. We'll see. You can see the wind swell pushing off California here. And whatever swell there is, looks like it'll intercept Hawaii, North Shore on Thursday, something like that. Some continued residual fetch slowly fading out from there. Theoretically, another tropical system, but we're a week out. Don't believe it, not for a second. Typhoon Marwar, the tr forecast track, and the last update was actually last night. Uh, the, the tropical uh, weather forecasters are not even monitoring it anymore. Winds 35 knots, pushing south of Japan, and then bound for the dateline, like what we suggested. Now, this system, back sometime last week, right after it passed Guam, See, heading that way. This is that recurvature thing we talk about. This happens during El Nino years. For it to happen at all in June, for one, for there to even be a tropical system as strong as this one was, winds were sustained at 180 uh, miles per hour. Very strong indeed. 
Fortunately, it did not take out Taiwan or any major landmass. Guam was relatively spared. Um, and by the time it got over here, winds were down in the tropical storm force. So nothing too bad. But the fact that it even recurves. Now, I said earlier, La Nina is in control of the South Pacific. But right over here in the West Pacific on the equator, it certainly smells that some sort of El Nino pattern is trying to get its foothold in. We'll get deeper into that in a minute, but the recurvature is a very good sign, especially as we get into the fall months or even the early part of fall, August, something like that. We could see some significant activity if the stars align. So assuming this system does what it's forecast to, and we're only like 36 to 48 hours out, so it seems reasonable that there will be some seas. Swell, you can see it right here, starting to hit the north shore of Oahu. Surf heights, three and a half to four feet, nothing huge. Pure swell, three feet, yeah, peaking about three feet at 13 seconds, something like that. So that'd be about four foot surf from 315 degrees. So late sea... Late season swell or super early uh, fall swell, depending on how you look at it, uh, possibly as we get into, what's that, Thursday, uh, Thursday, yeah, Thursday morning into Friday. That's all right. Take what you can get. With that, let's go take a look long term. What's going on with the Madden-Julian Oscillation and the El Nino-Southern Oscillation? The two major oscillations that affect our long-term weather patterns in the Pacific Basin, and that give us a pretty good idea what's going to happen a couple of weeks from now to even a couple of months from now in regards to surf, storm, and precipitation potential. We're going to start with the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, a periodic weather oscillation that traverses the planet from west to east on the equator. There are two phases to it, active and the inactive phase. They rotate west to east opposite each other. Active phase on one side of the planet, inactive phase on the other. They rotate west to east around the equator. So we're looking for signs of the active phase. That's the good phase. The inactive phase is the bad phase. Active phase is effectively a low pressure system. When it starts pushing over from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent and then into the West Pacific, what it does is it helps to dampen trade winds. It takes warm, moist air that's down at the surface, starts lifting it up into the atmosphere. Eventually, that energy, there's a lot of kinetic energy in there, that gets transferred into the jet stream. That imparts energy to the jet stream. The stronger the jet is, then you get bigger troughs like what we talked about earlier, and that helps feed storm development and therefore swell production. The other thing the active phase can do, and there's been a lot of this going on lately, is it dampens trade winds in the West Pacific. Trades typically blow from east to west. It can take those trade winds and just turn them to dead calm, or even more so, it can reverse the trade winds. When that happens, it's known as a westerly wind burst. A westerly wind burst takes warm water that's on the surface in the West Pacific, actually even over the maritime continent in the little islands there in Indonesia, starts pushing them that warm water from west to east, and it starts draining on the equator down into the Pacific Ocean. And as the active phase of the MJO and its associated westerly wind anomalies start moving across the Pacific, it gives that warm water momentum. That warm water then follows the thermocline under the equator, traverses the whole way across the Pacific, from West Pacific to East Pacific, eventually erupting over the underneath or up under the Galapagos and then slamming into the coast of Ecuador, erupting to the surface, creating a warm water slick. If you have successive active phases of the MJO in that ball of warm water, that's known as a Kelvin wave. If you have successive active phases of the MJO, they can create successive Kelvin waves. And when you start getting this massive buildup of warm water off of Ecuador and Peru and that area, that starts changing the atmosphere above it, okay? When the warm surface water becomes what they call coupled with the atmosphere above it, that everything changes in the Pacific and the swell machine turns on, the rain machine turns on in winter months, and then we have very favorable conditions for large surf in the Pacific. We are not there yet, but we are six Kelvin waves into that process, uh, I think 
three, one, two, three of those Kelvin waves have not yet even erupted in the uh, East Pacific yet, but we already have warm water building up off of Peru and Ecuador. So we're deep into what appears to be the beginnings of a coupled cycle. Let's get into those details. So we're going to start first off MJO examination, all right? We're looking at winds on the equator. This is the East Pacific here, West Pacific here, the equator right there, New Guinea there, Dateline there. We're just looking at the arrows. The arrows give you wind direction out of the east. Okay, that's New Guinea down there, believe it or not. Okay, wind's pretty strong out of the east over the East Pacific, moderately strong over the Central Pacific, and pretty light over what we call the Kelvin Wave Generation Area, the West Pacific, the area from 170 west, five just five degrees north and south of the equator, a box right there. If you get those light winds or reverse of trade winds in here, then you can create Kelvin waves. We're all about monitoring Kelvin waves because that helps usher in El Nino. All right, but it's not the actual wind speed. It's the anomalies. Difference from normal for this time of year. In the East Pacific, yeah, winds are blowing pretty strong on the east, but look at this. We got arrows pointing out of the west, suggesting that these winds are lighter than normal, so there's westward momentum. Central Pacific, same deal. Uh, I'm sorry, eastward momentum, west anomalies. And in the Kelvin Wave Generation area, west anomalies. This is exactly what you want to see to suggest the active phase of the MJO is over the Pacific, and that is good for everyone. So what's the forecast for the next week? And what has been happening the past couple of weeks? All right, we're looking at 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies. That's really up wind anomalies. Are they more east or west than normal? Up at about, what, 4,700 feet? That's a pretty good uh, approximation for what's going on at the surface. Now, this is the whole plan on one chart. The date line runs right up the middle here. The far west Pacific is about 125 west right there. Kelvin wave generation area from here to about here, so you draw a line right up there. Okay, the reds are westerly anomalies. That's what we want, active phase of the MJO. The blues, easterly anomalies. That would be the inactive phase of the MJO. All right, now going back in time to the beginning of May, we saw this really looks like the active phase of the MJO just working its way across the Pacific. You can see it. Strong in mid-May, we had a strong westerly wind burst. It lasted from the 14th of May into about the 29th. So what's that? Two weeks. That's typically what you would get associated with a pretty good, robust, active phase of the MJO. This has likely generated a Kelvin wave. Here we are today. Westerly anomalies, these yellows starting to fade out. Last of the active phase, south of California, moving into Ecuador. Ecuador is about 80 west, something like that. So we see then for the next one, two, three weeks, easterly anomalies per the GFS model and probably the inactive phase of the MJL. So another way to monitor the MJO is by cloud cover. If the active phase of the MJO is a low-pressure system, you get clouds associated with it. The inactive phase is a high-pressure system, cloud-free, all right? So here's a panel going out 15 days. That's about two weeks, okay? Each panel, let's see, has South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea, Australia. Kelvin Way, oh, Dateline right there. The equator EQ right there. Kelvin wave generation area, all important, right there. We see yellows. Yellows are cloud-free skies. So this looks like the beginning of the inactive phase, pushing over the Kelvin wave generation area today. Basically forecast, very weak, just sort of holding there for the next two weeks. And let's see what the, now that's per the statistic model. Let's see what the GFS model says. It says, yeah, that's supposed to go for about, a week or so, get very weak, and then two weeks from now, the blue cloudy sky is starting to build again over the maritime continent right there and into the West Pacific. Potentially yet another Kelvin wave? Who knows, but maybe. All right, so let's dig in a little deeper. These are phase diagrams for the statistic model, the dynamic model. It just drills in and gives you a little more detail on what's going on with the active phase of the MJO. How do you read this chart? Well, the MJO moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent to the West Pacific, to the East Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot is where the active phase is right now, so it's in the far uh, 
East Atlantic, maybe even working its way over uh, North Africa or over Africa. Uh, the further this heavy dot is away from the circle, the stronger it is. So very weak active phase over there. The forecast track for these three little thingies here have it moving two weeks from now into the Indian Ocean and very weak per the statistic model. Dynamic model suggests active phase racing east, moving very weakly into the West Pacific, very weakly, I mean, <laughs> there's the circle, and it's like dead in the middle of the circle. Uh, so very weakly into the West Pacific two weeks from now. Let's go out 40 days. This is the upper level model showing areas favorable for precipitation. Again, active phase, if it's low pressure, would be favorable for, for precip. If the inactive phase, dry air, high pressure, right? The green areas are wet air. The yellows and oranges, dry air, okay? Now there's South America, Central America, Hawaii is that dot right there, New, uh, New Guinea's right there, the equator's right there, Dateline right there. We see greens in the Pacific, so a very, very weak active phase, maybe hangover still left over the Pacific. Traversing still over the far east Pacific into mid-June, but you see the inactive phase of the MJO dry air trying to build in the West Pacific probably reaching its peak somewhere around late June, per the statistic model, and then fading out as a weak active phase tries to set up as we get into the early part of July. So June kind of a wash, July maybe things building some. Let's compare that to some more models. This is the CFS model. Again, we're looking at the east-west component of the wind. Maybe we can frame that up a little. There we go. All right, the date line runs right up the middle. East-west component of the wind over the whole planet. 120 east is right there. This is the far west Pacific. Okay, so, and this is past performance here. This is the forecast down here. Now, the dotted contour is the inactive phase of the MJO, and the blues are its associated easterly anomalies. So here is the first active phase in March. Pretty strong westerly anomalies. That probably produced a Kelvin wave. A dotted contour here, the inactive phase in the latter part of April. May, here is our most recent and very robust active phase of the MJO. Just fit, here's the beginning, June 2nd, just finishing up right now. But notice this, the dotted contour, inactive phase, like just about a week and a half making its way out of the Kelvin wave generation area. And westerly anomalies, for the most part, Part, holding in the Kelvin wave generation area. This is exactly what we want to see is in a developing El Nino, even during the inactive phase of the MJO, you can get westerly anomalies blowing, whereas during this sort of neutral to El a La Nino-ish pattern, you'd have the blues clear, actually the uh, inactive phase almost stronger than the active phase. You can see it here, but now pretty much reaching parity, or if anything, the scales are tilting in favor of the active phase and westerly anomalies, even during the inactive phase. This is exactly what you want, because those westerly anomalies, again, create Kelvin waves, and they impart energy to the jet stream, especially in winter months in the northern hemisphere. And then finally, the CFS model going out three months. Past performance is down here. The forecast is up here. Again, date line right, right up the middle. This is the west and east component of the wind. Yellows and oranges, westerly anomalies associated with the active phase of the MJO. And blues, easterly anomalies. So what are we looking at here? Well, we're going back to February. Westerly anomalies traverse the Pacific. Oh, yeah, and Pacific starts about 125 east, or the Kelvin wave generation area goes to about 170 west. So we saw active phase, westerly anomalies pushing the, across the Pacific in February, another one in March, the most recent one here in May, and then from here on out, steady westerly anomalies in the Kelvin wave generation area. This would suggest, and this is the weakest version of the model I've seen in a couple of weeks. I mean, the model for sure oscillates, and it has its good days and bad days. Um, 
this would be what I would call a bad day or a less favorable day for the CFS model. That said, still looks incredibly impressive for the Pacific. So from here on out, westerly anomalies in control. That just is steadily feeding warm water, pushing warm water to the East Pacific. As we get into August, things get really juicy. Let's overlay the MJO. All right, so here's our current, at the, the solid red active phase of the MJO, pretty much petering out. Then we got our inactive phase going from now till about oh, the early part of July, something like that. But westerly anomalies persisting. And then this is the, the weakest version of the active phase of the MJO I've seen in, in, you know, in, there's been one forecast for the July, August time frame. This is the weakest iteration of it, but still solid with westerly anomalies right now. Here's the real key to all this. The high pressure, low pressure, bias all right like the dotted contours for the mjo there's a you see this black dotted contour here this is a high pressure bias uh that is the la nina signal the black solid contour is the el nino signal so back in february we had high pressure over the dateline datelines right there the La Nina signal in the Pacific with the El Nino signal, the low pressure bias over the maritime continent. Well, what's happened between over the past, was that three or four months? The high pressure bias is now pretty much over California and the low pressure bias is filling the bulk of the North or, or the bulk of the equatorial Pacific with two contour lines forecast building to a third one, and I've seen some runs with even a fourth contour building as we get into fall, would not be uh, uh, unreasonable to, to expect that to happen. As we get into August, the low pressure bias pretty much nudging right up to a point off the California coast and filling the entire Pacific Ocean. This is exactly what you want to see if you, you know, if you want a screaming El Nino signal, this is it. Now, that was a forecast. Let's just get down to the ground truth. What is going on in the Pacific Ocean right at this moment in time? Now, we're not talking about the atmosphere, right? we got to first examine the ocean, and then we examine the atmosphere and see if the two of them are coupled, right? But let's go dig deep. We're going to start talking Kelvin waves. West Pacific here, East Pacific here. This is data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. The cool thing about the buoys is it's just not the buoy bobbing on the surface. They're anchored to the ocean floor in, in very, very deep water. And NOAA, in their uh, genius, decided to add some sensors to those anchor lines. Those little X's are the sensor. They measure water temperature. As a Kelvin wave passes by the buoys, these sensors are going to pick up that data, okay, and then use a model to fill in the gap. So what do we have here? Well, 30 degree centigrade anomalies. That's very warm water. Last week it was, or the last video was somewhere right around 170 east. Still is there today. That's good news. The 29 degree isotherm, I think it was, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is at 170 west. It's now to about 168, 167. So warm water moving east there. The 28 degree isotherm, about where it was, maybe moved to two, uh, two degrees off to the east. And the 24 degree isotherm solid right into Ecuador. So warm water. So during La Nina, it was all cold water here. So we have a healthy flow of warm water pushing east, but it's not the actual water temperatures. It is the anomalies. The difference from normal for this time of year. You can clearly see now, well, three degree anomalies here. I'm not even, this was just starting to show up the last video. And there was a little bit of a break in the two degree anomalies in here. Now they're solid the whole way across the Pacific, feeding into a three, four, five degree. That's like, what, eight or nine degrees Fahrenheit above normal off of Ecuador and the Galapagos. So this is, Really, let's see, this is, I tried to do the math here. Kelvin wave number five, I think this is here. Kelvin waves four and three are sort of all bunched up and just backed up here and just bleeding up to the surface. And we know we just had another active phase of the MJO just wrap up, and we think there's more warm water falling south of the thermocline. In fact, 
like the 28 or the 26 degree thermocline. So warm water falls south. You can see it literally falling here. Then it follows the thermocline along and then, boom, erupts to the surface here. So multiple Kelvin waves in flight with another forecast or not another forecast, another one likely building behind that from the most recent active phase of the MJO. Other data using different technologies, satellite data, it actually isn't reading temperatures, but they're assuming or inferring temperatures based, based on ocean height. We'll get into that in the next slide. But basically painting the same picture. Big old ball of warm water here. Multiple Kelvin waves all backed up and just bleeding up to the surface. Another Kelvin wave developing and off here, we think yet number six developing here. So six, five, four, three, two and one have already erupted and are on the surface and getting caught by trades. Um, quite an impressive machine. Sea level anomalies. This is, and this is kind of a hard chart to read, but that's Chile, Peru, uh, Ecuador, Central America, uh, New Guinea there, the equator right there, Dateline right there. Again, this is a satellite beaming down radar off the ocean surface calculating is the sphere of the ocean higher or lower than normal. These are not temperatures. These are actual ocean heights. Centimeters we're talking about. Not much, that much. But th what the technology does is you get a measurement of the ocean, of the sphere of the ocean, take out the wind waves, the swell, the tides even, is the sphere higher and low or lower than normal? Why does that matter? Well, warm water at depth expands. It'll displace water above it on the ocean upward. You can see it right here. Uh, zero centimeter anomalies, 5, 10, 15, 15, 20 centimeters. So warm water the whole way across the Pacific. What really matters is 5 degrees north and south. So just in that band from there to there. You can see warm water, multiple Kelvin waves have impacted, boom, right here, and then they start diffracting north up towards Mexico, south towards Chile. Clear El Nino signal, piles of warm water in the pipe, and back in here, these are the, uh, the maritime continent. When the active phase is producing westerly anomalies over here, it takes all that warm, shallow water there and starts pushing it, dumping it off into deeper waters here, and then that's the beginning of the Kelvin wave cycle. And this is kind of my favorite chart here because it puts everything sort of in a in a time sequence. You can look back in time and see what's going on. Upper ocean heat anomalies, but basically I call it the uh, the Kelvin wave monitoring chart. West Pacific here, East Pacific here, going back a year, June 2022. Yeah, we had a Kelvin wave during La Nina. Made it half, two-thirds of the way across the Pacific. Petered, giant cold water, the blue, colder than normal water response. But then we got into December. Little baby Kelvin wave didn't even quite make it across the Pacific. But then you had just this very muted cold response from it. That was Kelvin wave number one. Kelvin wave number two in January, you can see it right there. Kelvin wave number three in March. Kelvin wave number four in April. Kelvin wave number five in May. Okay, this is not associated with the most recent active phase of the MJO. That one, there's yet another Kelvin wave that's not even showing on this chart. So the clear pattern is cold regime switching rather quickly to a warm machine. It takes three months for warm water Kelvin wave to make it from over here to here. Okay, so just looking at this, you probably have at least a month of upwelling, if not more, just in all this ball of warm water here. You have another Kelvin wave three months behind that. So if this is, we'll say June 1st, June to July, August, September, and then we have another one that's not even on this chart that just formed now, and it's behind that. So a lot of warm water is in the pipe, and that will only fuel the El Nino development machine if all this continues. All right, let's go to the ocean surface. Sea surface temperature anomalies. Very clear, unmistakable El Nino signal here. Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Central America, Baja, Lots of warm water here off of Peru, 
and Ecuador, the trades blowing lightly from west to east, dragging this warm water across the equator. The, you know, we're looking at, there's a pretty well-developed warm finger developing in here, and even the extent of the anomalies right there to about 155 west. I'm waiting to see that get to 160. Not sure if it's going to make it anytime soon, but still a pretty clear El Nino signal developing. Oh, also, the last, no, remember we were talking about the gradient and north winds and high pressure and all that and upwelling along the California coast? You can still see that plain as day here. I went, I'm not going to do it right now, but I went and looked at a couple of pictures to see, well, is it growing, getting smaller? No, it's actually holding. The funny part is, you can see it here, there is bits of warming starting to develop from Point Reyes southward. So, most of this now... I think this is going to start slowly fading. It's pretty typical seasonal thing. Somewhere when you get into mid-June or so, this all starts dissipating. And then normally water temperatures, local water temperatures start warming from there. We expect that to happen shortly. Sea surface temperature trend for the past seven days. All right. So you look down here, Peru, Ecuador. Well, I don't see any warming there. Well, I, you know, and I, even myself, I was a bit concerned about this for the past two weeks, but I've decided it's not warming anymore because it's as warm as it can possibly get. This is not the actual water temperatures of the anomalies. This is just the trend over the past seven days. It's not getting cooler. It's just neutral. Basically, it's cooking. And then you see this steady warming out here on the equator. Again, it's all just five degrees north and south of the equator. That's where all the action is uh, in terms of its ability to influence the jet stream. What happens up here, what happens down here doesn't really matter. So we have slowly warming temperatures. But now you can also look here in California and up the coast here. Temperatures starting to warm there over the past couple of days. Then the backed off view, again, the uh, typical El Nino signal, cooking warm water here, forming a triangle that goes out like this. We certainly see that starting to happen. Normally, you don't see something like this till August or so. To have it be June 2nd and you have such a clear signal as this, very impressive indeed. Sea surface temperature anomaly trend, okay, in the Nina 1.2 area, this is the region right there by Ecuador and, uh, and uh, Peru and the Galapagos Island. Temperatures today, plus 1.955, almost 2 degrees above normal. Yes, we did have temperatures warmer back in April by up to 3 degrees, but in general, hovering right about the 2 degree mark, um, this just fluctuates based on how one what the trades are doing in this area. And we've gone through a bit of a, in the far east Pacific, the inactive phase of the MJO. The active phase now is moving from the west Pacific over the central and into the east Pacific. We would expect to see these temperatures maybe start rising a little bit in the couple next two weeks. But generally, quite warm temperatures. And then you move to the Nino 3.4 area. This is the official El Nino monitoring region, the region from a, on the equator from a point south of California out to about the dateline. Boom, just steady, upward, upward, upward. One little dip there. But today, uh, 682 thousandths of a degree above normal. The threshold between, uh, um, well, La Nina starts at a half a degree below normal. So we're nowhere in La Nina territory. El Nino starts at a half a degree above normal. So we hit it for about two days back in the early part of May. Then we dipped below. And now from, uh, oops, I'm sorry, half a degree is right here. Thank you. We bumped up for literally one day in, uh, in about mid-May, dropped below it, but now we're finally starting to get above the threshold. We've been one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, six days is not much of a trend. Like I said, it seems like we're in El Nino, but per the hard data, just the ocean temperatures are just now really starting to build solidly into that pattern. And it'll take the atmosphere... Uh, in, in more in the East Pacific than in the West Pacific, it'll take the atmosphere probably another month or two to start responding to this. So assuming this is going on now, by about 
late July, I think there would be some sort of a solid El Nino signal in the weather across the Pacific. So let's do a little comparative analysis here. Okay, so this is currently the setup as of June 2nd. Sea surface temperature anomalies, the warm signal off of Peru, the Galapagos right there, warm water bleeding out to about 155 west, and then really the whole way across the Pacific with the last little La Nina cool pool signal there. Now the last, what we call Super El Nino, was in 97. So let's compare June 2nd today to June 2nd of 97. You see, yes, now there's actually, temperatures are a little bit warmer right in here, but the signal is not ro as robust as defined as it is today, okay? This is like a more, less mature signal. Let's go back and forth. So there is, look at, look at the, already the clear anvil or triangle sort of setup. Warm temperatures out to 155 west. And we go this one, warm temperatures, yes, they're actually out past 155 west, but they're broken. They don't have much as much support around them. Hard to say which one is stronger, 97 or 2023. I don't know. I'm tempted right now to say 2023, but it seems like maybe, if anything, a tie. So either way, El Nino. And remember, 97 is what I consider the gold standard. That in 1982-83 uh, for Super El Ninos. We'll see whether this year's El Nino lives up and whether it can keep going uh, at the pace that the 97 El Nino developed at. The good news is we're pretty much out of the spring unpredictability barrier now. So the models should have a better feel on what's going on. All right, let's dig a little deeper. So what's going, we've talked about Kelvin waves and subsurface. We've talked about the machine that generates Kelvin waves, the MJO and the forecast for that. All that looks great. We've talked about what's going on on the ocean surface. Clearly a warm signal is building and developing, but what about the atmosphere above it? Does the atmosphere sense that anything is going on? Well, clearly the answer is yes, it does. We're looking at the Southern Oscillation Index. Difference in pressure between Darwin, Australia and Tahiti. Tahiti in the Pacific, Darwin roughly in the Indian Ocean. When pressure is lower in Tahiti. Remember we talked about the low pressure bias building over the Pacific. Well, that would should be reflected at Tahiti. When pressure is lower in Tahiti than, than Darwin, the index should be negative. It is, minus 13.43. And wait, look, let's go back in time. What is this? We were at minus 64 in uh, May 24th. We were at minus 29 just a couple of days ago. And we were down at minus 31 in earlier part of May. In fact, somewhere right around here, th uh, May 9th, things really started changing. We were on a good run of negative numbers. All right. So that's, but that's pretty noisy data. The average, the 30 day average, it, it looks back 30 days, but you get a better sense of what's happening. The trend is, well, today we're at minus 17.54. Where were we a month ago? Dead even. Wow, the index is dropping. This is a good sign. At a minimum, it suggests that the active phase of the MJO has been in pretty good control. Let's go look at the 90-day average. Okay, this is the El Nino-La Nina signature. We're at minus 7.15, and where were we a month ago? Still a little, it's pretty much neutral. We're not in El Nino territory, yes. I'd, I'd say when you get at like minus 12, then you're in El Nino territory. And when this guy is hovering constantly around minus 20, then you're in El Nino territory. But all this suggests the trend is definitely moving in the right direction. Uh, that said, the a inactive phase of the MJO is setting up and is going to go for the next two weeks, something like that. So it'll probably put a little dent in this. But after that, we should be off to the races. Let's go look at this data graphed out. If ever there was a graph I wanted to see, this is it. The 30-day moving SOI, looking back in time, okay, remember when we're in positive territory, like 20, like where we had been, the downward spikes are the inactive phase of the MJO, the upward spike, I'm sorry, the active phase, the upward spikes of the inactive phase. You saw we were in a steadily building pattern into, well, even into January 2023, but look at what's happening. 
active phase, active phase, active phase, active phase, just driving it down to nearly minus 20. This is talk about going from plus 25 to almost minus 20 in what, five, five months? One, two, three, four. Yeah, five months. That is a significant shift, clearly indicating momentum, a lot of momentum towards development of El Nino. All right. And finally, the forecast for the official El Nino Montan region, the sea surface temperature anomaly forecast for the Nino 3.4 region, that area on the equator from California out to about the dateline from the CFS version 2 model. All right, so where are we? We're at June, somewhere right around here. Temperatures 6, 7 tenths of a degree above normal in El Nino territory. As we get to the end of July, temperatures to Oh, 1.4 degrees above normal. That's clear El Nino territory. And this is the raw data. It's probably overhyped. Saying temperatures getting up to 2.2 degrees above normal in, oh, November, December, which is typically the peak of El Nino. Now we're going to go look at the more tempered data. PDF corrected. It has its temperatures still like 1.1 degrees above normal in July and then peaking at about 1.75 degrees, clearly in El Nino territory. The threshold, remember, is half a degree above normal. So we are clearly marching all to the say uh, towards an El Nino, a whole bunch of all the other model models basically painting some flavor of this, maybe not as strong, some weaker, some stronger. Um, this model might be a little bit on the high end, but again, looking at what happened in 97 and where we are compared to that, we're right on track. It's arguably the same, if not a hair bit stronger, so seems we're moving in the right direction. Well, we're moving in the right direction, but where's my surf? <laughs> well, we know it's coming, okay? We are still trying to get La Nina kicked out of the atmosphere. Um, the atmosphere is like a giant boat. It takes a long time to turn. We just now are getting over the threshold of being clearly out of La Nina, clearly out of nor even normal territory, moving into El Nino-ish territory. We've only been there for a week or two or three, okay? And it's going to take a couple of months before the jet stream and everything recalibrates itself and goes, yes, I agree, something significant has happened. But when the atmosphere starts really responding to what's going on at the ocean and they get coupled, then the train really leaves the station and there's no turning back. And it looks like that's going to start happening somewhere in the later July time frame, just in time as we get into the fall. The expectations are for solid surf. And then as we get deeper into uh, winter, bigger surf, uh, the problem is that maybe it might be a bit stormy at times, uh, potentially decent rainfall for California, certainly not below normal rainfall for California. Now, the drought pattern would set up more in the northern tier states if you're into skiing and you're looking at Oregon, Washington, uh, British Columbia, that sort of thing. Snow would not be focused there. It would be more focused southern tier, California, Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, that sort of thing. So just something to consider. Again, we're still a ways out from any of this actually happening. But right now, all things are looking positive and moving in the right direction. We just need to be patient for the ocean to, or the atmosphere to get coupled with the ocean. And then the swell machine should fire up in earnest. All right, that's our video for this week. If you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up. We'd appreciate it. Um, uh, if you have any comments or questions, a lot of technical de detail here, just write up in the comments section. We'll try our best to reply. It might take us a couple of days. i got some plans going on. That's why the video is happening uh, tonight instead of Sunday night. But by next Sunday, we'll be back on track, regular forecast schedule, and uh, then I'll get the site updated uh, sometime later next week as well. All right, that's it for this week. We'll do it again next week. Same time, same channel. Thanks for watching.